Hello, everyone. This is Serious Trivia, and welcome back to the final episode of the Druga Down Northern Expedition lore series as we conclude with episode 18, titled Legacy. Now, in our last episode, we covered Druga Down's death, which spelled the end for the 5th Northern Expedition. But unfortunately, due to Druga Down's death, infighting amongst the Shuhan general will soon break out on the retreat through the Balsia Path. Previously, we discussed about the multiple cliques and personalities within the Kingdom of Shuhan and how Drugodown's dominance of the court kept every side in check. But with Drugodown's death, factions soon started to emerge as all sides wanted a piece of the power that was now up for grabs in Drugodown's absence. And this started with the control of the army itself. Now, in Drugodown's final days, the control of the expedition army was given to Yang Yi, and Fei Yi, who were military advisors. But Wei Yan, who was the second highest ranking Shu Han general after Zhuge Liang, naturally felt that he was the most deserving candidate to take control of the expedition force, especially since he was originally the one in charge of Han Zhong prior to Zhuge Liang's arrival for the northern expeditions. However, due to a difference in strategy and risk tolerance, Zhuge Liang did not entrust the army to Wei Yan, and even kept him out of the discussions as only Yang Yi, Fei Yi, and Jiang Wei were present when the final retreat plans were being made. Now, Zhuge Liang did worry that Wei Yan might rebel in this circumstance, so he instructed that if Wei Yan disobeys the retreat order, then they may do as they see fit with him. But just as Zhuge Liang passed away, and the retreat orders were given, Wei Yan raised his voice in dissent as he proclaimed that with the prime minister's passing, he should now be in charge given his rank, and that the 5th Northern Expedition must continue. Now, in a testament to Wei Yan's arrogant personality and lack of friends within the Shuhan army, aside from his own retinue, the entire army started to retreat, obeying the orders of the chief military advisor, Yang Yi, and leaving Wei Yan behind. Furious, Wei Yan decided to march his smaller, much more mobile force ahead of the main army, as he started to burn and damage the Balsia Path in order to slow the main army down, while posturing his force at the south end of the path to block the main army from returning into Hanzhong, as he wanted them to turn around and resume the expedition under his command. At the same time, both Yang Yi and Wei Yan already sent messengers ahead to Chengdu, reporting that the other had rebelled, and when given such conflicting reports, Emperor Liu Shan asked officials Jiang Wan and Dong Yun which report to trust, and both men sided with Yang Yi, which once again goes to show you how Wei Yan's personality did him no favors. But the court cannot resolve such matters with just words, as once the main army under Yang Yi arrive at the southern exit of the Balsia Path, Wei Yan would actually send his vanguard forces to attack. In response, Wang Ping was sent by Yang Yi to counter. However, before the bloodshed could happen, Wang Ping appealed to Wei Yan's vanguards by stating that, with the prime minister's body still not cold, how could you act in such a way against your fellow comrades? And knowing that what their commander Wei Yan was doing was wrong, his troops started to surrender in mass as Wei Yan was now forced to flee south with a few remaining loyalists. Now just as Wei Yan had hated Yang Yi personally even before this entire ordeal, Yang Yi also hated Wei Yan, and seeing that Wei Yan was now defeated and on the run, Yang Yi wanted to seize this opportunity and eliminate Wei Yan once and for all, so he ordered Ma Dai to give chase. And Wei Yan would make it as far as the north gate of Han Zhong before Ma Dai would catch up to him and slay him on the spot, which is also where you'll find Wei Yan buried today. But Wei Yan's death did not satisfy Yang Yi, as he would then go on to order for the execution of Wei Yan's clan to the third degree which meant the extermination of Wei Yan's father's clan, his mother's clan, and his own line as well. Now, what Yang Yi did here was far beyond what was fair or necessary, as his personality was no better than Wei Yan's. 
and it showed in the aftermath of Zhuge Liang's death when he was ultimately not selected to become the next prime minister as Jiang Wan was the suggested choice. This was a huge disappointment to Yang Yi as he ended up expressing this frustration to Fei Yi, who he was close to in the army as they had both served under Zhuge Liang as military advisors. Now, Yang Yi was not just venting about not being picked to be the next prime minister, he was lamenting how if he had instead surrendered the northern expedition forces to Wei in the aftermath of Zhuge Liang's death, he would surely be selected for a high post in the Wei court. Fei Yi, who shared the same sense of loyalty to the Han as Zhuge Liang, would ultimately report Yang Yi to the court and Yang Yi would be stripped of all his titles and positions because of this. However, even as a commoner, Yang Yi continued to slander the court in public, which prompted the court to issue for his arrest. Now, fearful for the lives of his family, Yang Yi would ultimately commit suicide before his capture, as his family would be allowed to live out their days within Shuhan. So in the end, the power struggle between Yang Yi and Wei Yan ended with both of them dying as the transition of power went smoothly to Jiang Wan back in Chengdu with the support of Emperor Liu Shan as the legacy of Zhuge Liang's northern expeditions will continue four years later in 238 as Jiang Wan will once again march the Shuhan army back into Hanzhong to continue the attacks on Wei. Now, with the aftermath of the final northern expedition covered, let's shift our attention back to Zhuge Liang, as his final wish was to have his body buried at Mount Dingjun in Hanzhong, with a simple burial where a hole just big enough for his casket would suffice. He would also write in a letter to Emperor Liu Shan, asking him to not award his clan any additional land, title, or wealth, as they had plenty to sustain themselves with an 800 mulberry tree orchard for silkworm farming and 15 qing of farmland, which equals to 500,000 square meters or roughly 125 acres of land. Now, this is not a small estate by any means, but for our prime minister, this is extremely limited as 15 qin of land was the standard grant to an eighth tier official during the Jin dynasty out of a total of nine tiers, which goes to show you how Zhuge Liang was not in the business of enriching his own clan when the prime minister position is a top tier or first tier position. And speaking of his own clan, Zhuge Liang would be survived by an eight-year-old son, Zhuge Zhan, who was born just a year prior to him leaving for the first northern expedition and will return to Zhuge Zhan in the future when we cover the fall of Shu Han lore series. Now, Emperor Liu Shan will still award Zhuge Liang with the posthumous title of Zhong and Wu, which means loyalty and martial. And this goes beyond all traditions, as posthumous titles for officials have always been just one character. But traditions will be broken with Zhuge Liang, as Zhong Wu would also become known as the highest tier of posthumous titles for all dynasty to follow in Chinese history, and temples would also be built in Zhuge Liang's honor all throughout Shu Han, including Chengdu's Wu Hou Shrine, which still stands today, and sits right next to Liu Bei's tomb. Certainly, at the end of the day, the northern expedition did not result in any material gains for the kingdom of Shu Han, but it did dramatically shift the Kingdom of Wei's focus westwards, as they were real threats. Now, we often hear arguments about how the expeditions were a waste of resources and manpower that could have been better used, but I would argue, given the disparity of manpower, landmass, and resources between the Kingdom of Shu Han and the Kingdom of Wei, the route of a defensive development race would have just widened the gap between the two kingdoms, and even though the northern expeditions were a huge expenditure of resources and manpower for the kingdom of Shuhan, it came at a much steeper price for Wei, which at very least helped close the gaps between the two kingdoms. And statements regarding how the northern expeditions exhausted the kingdom of Shuhan's resources is also really misguided, 
As the interior regions of Shuhan were largely unaffected by these expeditions, aside from the initial conscription of the army, as a good portion of the supplies used in these later expeditions came from the Tuntian farms within Hanzhong, especially considering how the Kingdom of Shuhan would continue to exist for another 30 years, while another 11 northern expeditions would be launched by Jiang Wei. And if we are really looking for the true reason behind Shuhan's decline, it would be the assassination of Fei Yi in 253 and the subsequent faltering of the internal management of the court, which we'll eventually get to see in a future lore series. For now, our Zhuge Liang's Northern Expedition lore series has officially come to an end, as we'll return next week with a new series that will be determined by a community post vote on the channel, which is live right now. So please go check that out, and I'll see you all then. And hopefully you all have enjoyed this episode and this entire series enough to hit that like button to help out the channel. And I'll see you all next time. Bye!